आधी ते कर मग बाकीच गुड आफ्टरनून कलिग्स आई वेलकम यू ऑल फॉर टूडेज पीओजीएस वेबिनार कनेक्ट विथ एक्सपर्ट्स Our webinars have been appreciated by one and all, from not only Pune, POJs, but also from all the various societies of Foxy all over India. It is our endeavor to connect with the experts of various sub-specialities of the subject of obstetrics and gynecology. Today's topic is SUI, that is stress urinary incontinence, and to speak on this subject, we have a world-renowned. World acclaimed urogynecologist of international repute, Professor Ajay Rani. England-born Professor Ajay Rani is an alumni of BJ Medical College. He has done his undergraduate and post-graduation at BJ Medical College, Pune, and is known to many Punekers. He took sub-specialty training in urogynecology in England, and then moved to Townsville, Queensland, in Australia, in 2000. where he completed his phd he is presently the head department of obstetrics and gynec james cook university he is a consultant urogynecologist at the townsville hospital queensland australia professor rane was a finalist of the australian of the year in 2012 and was awarded the order of australia in 2013 Professor Rane has spent two decades treating urogynecological patients in some of the poorest countries of the world, and in 2016, he was received the Mahatma Gandhi Pravasi Award for humanitarian work in women's health. He received the Pride of Australia in 2019. Professor Rane has been instrumental in conducting training programs and courses in urogynecology. and has a lot of research publications to his credit he has been the innovators of perigi miniac dunezi and so i present before you professor ajay rane to deliver his talk on sui unraveling the mystery from anatomy to treatment okay. professor rane you may please start okay good uh so um first of all uh, i hope the audience can see me and ashwini you're going to monitor the uh, make sure that they can hear me correctly and uh, see me correctly uh, thank you so much so first of all uh, namaskar to everybody and thank you for giving me this invitation it's indeed a great honor and a pleasure to be here in my hometown which is pune so i hope all punekers are practicing uh, safe distancing um and uh, social uh, isolation um very important because we are just coming out of it from the other side it would be very very remiss of me if i did not thank harshad chaitanya and ashwini from pogs to for their dynamic pace at which they got me and uh how they have managed to uh, organize this meeting so quickly if i was to honestly mention amazing people that i have seen in the list of attendees you will not hear the talk because everybody that i can mention will take one whole hour so thank you all of you who have attending especially girja wag i've known her for so long Mangesh Narwarkar, Tanvir, my fellow from Hyderabad, Rosa, Parag, Mita Nakhre. It's a, it's, it's bad. If I just kept going, you will not get the lecture. So I'm really sorry. Uh, I just want to say a general hello and namaste to you all. And um, I am so, so emotional to be with you um, through this Zoom meeting. Thank you so much for for sharing um, your time with me. I know it's very It's three o'clock, but uh, look, we'll have some fun today, and um, I think that's the most important part. So let's have some fun. 
uh, when people talk of SUI, oh, sir, SUI badal bola, means hala bomla. Amala, you know, sagra badal bola ichi ichcha hai. Phakte SUI kai. But today, I think Ashwini has told me no. To me, phakte SUI badal bola ichi. So I'm going to only speak about SUI, which is fine, but um, it is all interrelated. So let's kick off. Uh, now the most other important thing I need to make sure you can see my PowerPoint presentation. So if you want to talk of SUI or stress urinary incontinence, basically it is leakage of urine on effort, sudden physical exertion or sneezing and coughing. So what it is not is continuous leakage of urine. What it is not is leakage of urine when you can't hold it anymore. What it is specifically is leakage on sudden, and remember that word sudden, increase of effort during coughing, sneezing, or sporting activities. So this is very important to understand. What does that sudden mean? Because a lot of people say that if you have an abdominal tumor or if you're very obese, that means the in increased abdominal pressure can cause stress incontinence. That's not sudden. That takes a long time. So one has to be very careful about your diagnosis of urinary stress incontinence. Okay, good. So I want you to start thinking about, because um, I, what I was going to do was actually ask you questions and ask for answers, but I don't think that's going to work. <laughs> it's not interactive, it's too many people. But in red or in colors, I have some questions. And so I think the first thing we need to understand is pelvic anatomy. Now, pelvic anatomy basically is something that the urogynecologist looks as the property of three apertures. So you have got three apertures here. You have got the urethra, the vagina, and the rectum. And urogynecologists actually look after all three of these systems. So we look after lower female urinary tract, we look after the entire genital tract, but we also look after the lower gastrointestinal tract. So that's why urogynecology is holistic. It looks after bladder, bowel, vagina. So you can't just isolate uh, diseases in women like stress urinary incontinence because along with that, there will be other overlapping disorders because either there is a neurogenic element to it or there is a pathological dislocation of fascia or there is a sexual dysfunction. So, so many different things overlap. So, stress urine cons alone, uh, we'll talk, tackle that first, but then understand that it is a holistic disorder. We have 146 participants. I am enjoying this. Okay, so you will hear things like levator ni muscle. But Sagalezan to me, everybody wants to do pelvic muscle exercise. So we call this phenomenon death by pelvic muscle exercises. I think one has to understand that pelvic muscle exercises have to be extremely targeted and only for a short while because if they are not effective, you need to move on and do surgical treatment or other treatments. So the maximum amount of time you're allowed to do pelvic muscle exercises, provided you're doing them correctly, is 16 weeks. If you don't get better after that, you need to see treatment options apart from just pelvic muscle exercise. And then what happens? They come back and say, oh, the pelvic muscle exercise didn't work. So you tell the patient, no, that's because you're not doing them properly. So it's basically they're blaming the patient. That's not true. So uh, we have to understand what happened. So I think what is important to understand is the difference between the pelvic diaphragm, levator ani muscles, and perineal body. These are three integrated muscle groups, but they are separate in function. Now my question, 
uh, in the privacy of your own home, which you are now with your Zoom, and you can mute. I want you to think about your levator muscle. And when you cough, I want you to cough and feel what happens to your levator muscle. So you can go, <coughs> and you want to see what happens to your levator muscle. Then you can do a valsalva, which is bearing down and see what happens to your levator muscle. Is it the same or is it different? And here it was supposed to be interactive, but I will give you the answers. Okay, so what we are looking at is from underneath, you can see bulbocavernosis, uh, bulbospongiosis, ischiocavernosis, perineal bodies, superficial transverse perineae form the lowermost part of the muscular uh, support of the lower third of the vagina. Puborectalis and pubococcygeus are the only two muscles that you can voluntarily control. So when we talk about pub uh, pelvic muscle exercises, you are talking only about puborectalis and pubococcygeus. You cannot voluntarily control or contract ileocoxygeus or ischiocoxygeus, otherwise your pelvis will be moving like a butterfly. It doesn't move. So the only voluntarily controlled muscles that you can do are puborectalis and pubococcygeus. These muscles are easily fatigable. They do not hypertrophy. So if you did pelvic muscle exercises, your hands don't become like my biceps, right? So they don't hypertrophy, but you can make them work a bit quicker. You can increase the fast twitch fiber contraction. This is important only because I want you to understand the whole concept of the treatment of pelvic muscle exercises. Because everyone says, before delivery, do pelvic muscle exercises. During delivery, do pelvic muscle exercises. After delivery, do pelvic muscle exercises. When you're driving, do pelvic muscle exercises. When you're not driving, do pelvic exercises. But I think the understanding is, what are you really trying to achieve? That is very important. So the answer to my question is, when you cough, the levator braces. When you do a valsalva, the levator balloons. Diametrically opposite actions. Levator braces when you cough. Levator balloons when you do valsalva. Therefore, asking a woman to push to demonstrate stress incontinence is wrong. You really want to ask them to cough, not push. Same thing is applied when you want to see prolapse. Don't ask them to cough, ask them to push because you want to see the levator balloon and see what structures are coming out. Very basic difference. Because when we assess prolapse, we say, Kasigoro. Wrong, because the levator is pricing. You want them to balloon it by valsalva. So there are two very important principles you need to understand. When you assess stress incontinence, you want to see cough. When you assess prolapse, you want to ask them to do valsalva. You want that levator to balloon so to see if the organs come out. This is very important even for colorectal prolapse. This is very important for genital prolapse. So I know there might be some surgical colleagues uh, joining us. I heard Pradeep Sharma wants to join in. So very important to understand that this is a composite muscle supporting lower genital tract, lower urinary tract, and lower gastrointestinal tract. Don't get confused with external and internal anal sphincter. This is totally separate, okay? Good. If you look at the prevalence of urinary stress incontinence, people will tell you anywhere between four and 35%. I think that 35% is probably more a realistic figure than 4%. Um, unless you're from Sweden or Norway where they all start doing pelvic exercises, I think in, even in utero, uh, because they've got Professor Karibo who wants everyone to do pelvic muscle exercise, living dead, doesn't matter, everybody has to do it. So, uh, but I think in general, you're looking at between 20 and 35%. This actually increases. This increases with um, um, age. So aging 
is a very big phenomenon. So you have your babies, you might sustain some trauma, then comes aging. So we definitely know that women suffer from accelerated tissue aging after menopause, especially in the genital tract. There is no discussion about it. There is no controversy about it. Women suffer from accelerated skin and connective tissue aging after menopause. So if you have any defects in the lower genital tract, lower gastrointestinal tract, or lower urinary tract, you will see an exacerbation of symptoms in that case. So some people might say that that's very unfair. God was probably a man, and he probably was, because I think menopause is extremely unfair on women. And we don't do enough to help women go through that transitional phase of uh, genital um, and body um, aging, accelerated aging. So definitely something we need to take on board while we're looking after neurogynecological symptoms. Uh, so on the one hand, a woman might have stress incontinence. On the other hand, she has vaginal dryness. She has shrinkage or she has gaping vagina. So it plays havoc, accelerated um, genital aging plays havoc. Obesity definitely has a big uh, role to play. We are seeing, obviously, even in India now, obesity seems to be growing a lot. Uh, here in Australia, we are the second fattest nation in the world. So for us, uh, a pre-pregnancy booking weight of 120 kilos is nothing. You know, um, we are just used to very big people, but with that, you see a lot of pathology. Smoking, I underline, primarily because smoking has got a lot of different issues. Smoking, you will cough more. Therefore, you will probably get stress in front of you. But secondly, smoking actually adversely or actually accelerates tissue degeneration after menopause. So the commonest factor that we see in patients who have got what we call sling erosion after a sling operation, we'll show you those on the video, is smokers. 98% of women who get sling erosions in our series of 7,000 odd patients are smokers. So smoking does something very bad to tissue quality, even in the vagina. So it's nothing to do with just lungs, right? So smoking is very important. Pregnancy itself as a cause of urinary incontinence remains controversial. I think a lot of people say that, you know, it's pregnancy, it's carrying that you, baby itself can cause tissue damage. I'm not totally convinced at the moment because you can have women who have given birth to five, six, seven, eight babies and perfect vaginas, no prolapse, no incontinence. So I don't necessarily believe that pregnancy itself has got a big role, but childbirth definitely does. And childbirth, uh, if you look at the longest series um, called the Prolong study, uh, it shows that if you actually do elective cesarean sections on women, say either by maternal request or that they had some problems and right from the first baby, they all had cesareans, it's definitely shown to be protective in the first 10 years of a woman's reproductive age, while vaginal birth is definitely non-protective against stress urinary incontinence. That does not mean that you should do cesarean sections to prevent stress incontinence. So you will have to do nine unnecessary cesarean sections for a possible one case that you may protect against urinary incontinence. So, and as I said, early protection. After 10 years, the protective effect of cesarean disappears. So can't use that excuse to do unnecessary cesarean sections. Not allowed, okay? So I'm sorry that the science doesn't fly along that way. Uh, it is very important uh, to understand that. Okay, I know that you guys all do this history uh, examination, etc. I just want you to think a little bit more in what we call clusters. 
So first cluster is um, incontinence. Look at stress, urge, mixed. Another important one is high impact stress incontinence. So high impact means the patient says, I don't leak at all. But once I start running or I jump on a trampoline, uh, only then I leak. The other one we see in young girls is giggle incontinence. Uh, young girls should giggle, it's as should young boys. But some girls develop what's called as giggle incontinence. Now giggle incontinence is a variant of SUI, not urge. So a lot of people give them anticholinergics, oxybutynin, it doesn't work. Giggle incontinence is really a, a passing phase in a woman's life, a young girl's life. You can actually uh, get them to do some core exercises of the abdomen and they do very, very well. Next is uh, your voiding pattern. Frequency, six to eight per day. Urgency, when you need to go, you need to go. Nocturia, more than twice a night. So you need to be very clear when you ask these questions. And the next one, which is really important, is really about your voiding history. Because if you do any surgical intervention, you really need to know beforehand whether these people have any voiding dysfunction. Otherwise, they're going to say, Saran kare ali, kai, I can't pass urine. Manale don minta sa operation hai. Sorry. previous history, she could have told me that actually it takes me 10 minutes to empty my bladder. I sit there and it just comes in drips and drips and drips. I get dribbling. Every time I get up from the toilet, I feel that I haven't emptied enough. These are signs of voiding dysfunction. So you need to be very careful if you want to do surgical treatment in such patients. This urea hematuria, you will definitely always ask to an MSU. Digitation is very interesting. There is an anterior digitation and a posterior digitation. The anterior digitation is where a woman says, I have to reduce my prolapse to actually commence urination. This is usually in reasonably severe level two defects anteriorly like a cystocele. While posteriorly level two defects like a rectocele will need posterior digitation where the woman says, I have to put my fingers in the vagina to empty my bowel. So digitation is a very important urogynecological symptom. It's almost pathognomonic of what the problem is with the women, be it bowel or be it um, cystocele. The next part is quantification. How do you quantify incontinence? So you need to ask how many incontinence episodes per week how many pads do you change? How miserable are they? You know, you, and that is very important. You need to quantify it because if you did some form of treatment and you said, okay, you are using four pads per day. How many pads are you using now? And she goes, I don't use any, but I don't think your operation has worked. Then you say, well, no, hang on. That's not right. You may not be totally dry, but if you quantify your, incontinence loss, it's reduced by 70-80%. So it's very important to preoperatively quantify and also ask about their severity of affliction of quality of life. If you want, very simply, just go to femalepelvichealth.com.au. All these questionnaires that you can give your patients are available for free on my website please use them. They're really good because they give you a lot of information that you can use before you plan any treatment and give you an idea of how much the woman is suffering and how you can uh, chart their progress uh, with cure and, and therapy. Okay, so now we come to examination. We are half an hour through, Ashwini. I hope you realize that, right? So we're, we're going good. I think we're going good. I'm um, just gonna have a quick sip of water. <coughs> Lovely water. Um, uh, so we're going to look at genital inspection, genital examination, cough leak, 
and then pop q and baden walker classification i know that every one of you start getting uh, delirium tremens and uh, rigor mortis when you hear this pop q and baden walker it's not that complicated but we'll we'll try and make it very simple it is it is quite simple so what i did was again i was going to make it interactive and say what do you see at genital inspection what do you see at genital examination? But then um, I think the important part is we, we're not going to do that. So I'm going to move to my next slide. Ta-da, here you go. It, all the answers are there. So when you genitally inspect, you want to look at atrophy, you want to look at excoriation, and you want to look at presence of a bulge uh, coming out of the vagina. Genital examination usually should be done in the dorsal position, not necessarily in the lithotomy position. Some people do it um, in the left lateral position. If you are doing the dorsal position, which is ladies on the back, there is flexion of the hips, flexion of the knees, abduction of the hips, then that is good enough. You don't need to do anything else. What you must do though, is examination is always done at Valsalva. So you need to ask them to bear down, push down, or say, push down as if you're opening your bowels. Okay, so I think it's very important to understand what you tell the patient. Examine at Valsalva. That gives you an understanding of bulge, leak, hypermobility, um, and other pathologies. So examination should always be at Valsalva. Whatever you demonstrate should be at maximum strain or at Valsalva. So your note should say, at maximum strain, bladder is stage three or stage four, whatever you want to call it. Cough leak, you can do supine or standing. You can do that as a separate thing. All you people have ultrasounds in your rooms. So you can just do a quick volume of the bladder, never more than 200 ml in the bladder to do a cough test. In a cough test supine, be careful, otherwise you'll get it in your face. So just make sure that you're not facing directly at the urethra or make the woman stand and cough at 200 ml in your bladder. So that's your cough test for demonstrating stress urinary incontinence. Valsalva is to demonstrate tissue dislocation or tissue disruption, facile disruption, muscular disruption, hypermobility. Valsalva is not there to demonstrate incontinence, but you may see incontinence if that happens. Now, I'm going to make this pop Q Barden Walker very simple. Forget those names for one minute. All I'm going to tell you is a prolapse in a woman is only relevant if at maximum strain it is at the hymen or beyond the hymen. If it's not at the hymen or beyond the hymen, then that prolapse does not require surgery. Maybe it only requires surgery because you want to buy a new Mercedes or you want to send your children to expensive schools or you want Italian marble in your house. It does not help the patient. So very simple rule, prolonged study has shown this, lots of studies have shown it, that stage three and stage four prolapse are the only significant prolapses worth operating on, which will give the patient the result they deserve. So strain, if the bulge comes at the hymen or outside the hymen, then it's worth operating. There is no such thing as mild cystocele, mild rectocele. Next time when I come to Pune Harshad, if I find anybody doing saying mild cystocele, mild rectocele, I will kill them. But there is no such thing. The vagina has to be mobile. Vaginal mobility is not a disease. It's its function. Nobody's vagina is rigid. When you ask them to strain, there is always movement. Good. If you don't have movement, you can't have sex. You can't open your bowels. You can't open your bladder. So you need a vagina that is mobile. 
but vaginal mobility is not a disease. It's not mild sister seal, mild rectal seal. That is only for your Mercedes. So it has to be stage three or stage four prolapse. These are very important points that you need to understand. We follow as urogynecologists. But the chusran kare zayil na ti tumi na ikela da arre zaudia. Let them go. It's okay. It's okay. God has given everybody plenty. Don't worry about whether the patient will go to someone else. In fact, ask them to go to your worst enemy. Because they will not get better. You're doing an unindicated operation. Great. That was very good. Investigations for SUI are very important because if the patient complains of SUI, you will hear urologists, you will hear urogynecologists, they will always say, bladder is a very unreliable witness, which means there is a 70% overlap of symptoms. If you are, your diagnosis is stress incontinence, you may actually present with urgent incontinence and stress incontinence. Or if your diagnosis is urgent incontinence, you may actually present with stress incontinence. We have 188 participants. I'm telling my, uh, I'm trying to impress my super specialty fellow here about how amazing this stuff is. 188 participants, 187, someone died. It's okay. So I think there are two very important concepts we want to look at. One is intrinsic sphincter deficiency, and second one is hypermobility. So there are two important types of disorders in women who have stress incontinence. One is intrinsic sphincter deficiency, Second one is hypermobility. Ashwini wanted to talk on SUI. You are going to get only SUI. We are going into the RAM of it, right? Okay, good. So the three questions we ask is, who has intrinsic sphincter deficiency? Who has hypermobility? How is it diagnosed? And why is it important to diagnose this? Do we have, is it important to diagnose the difference between intrinsic sphincter deficiency, hypermobility, or whether a patient has combination intrinsic sphincter deficiency, hypermobility. And this was supposed to be interactive. But I'm giving you all the answers. Here we go, Ta-da! again. So who has intrinsic sphincter deficiency? Older women, women over the age of 70. Women who have had previous incontinence surgery. Women who have had radiation to the genital tract. What we call a stove pipe or a lead pipe urethra. The urethra is constantly open. It doesn't close, it has no mobility. It has got intrinsic muscles are all dead. Intrinsic sphincter deficiency. How is it diagnosed? Well, intrinsic sphincter deficiency, unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't know, is a urodynamic diagnosis. So people are going to say, oh, alliance urodynamics. So we're going to talk about that very important point, urodynamic, where the maximum, with 193 now, maximum urethral closure pressure is less than 20 centimeters of water. So there are people who do urodynamics and they don't do maximum urethral closure pressure. The good urodynamics, what's the point? You really need to do urodynamics for almost this very important reason. So I think urodynamics, you must learn to do urethral closure pressure. Why is it important to know about intrinsic sphincter deficiency? Very simple. You have extremely poor results with a TOT, a transobturator type, and very poor results with golfer suspension, and very poor results with physiotherapy. So why are you doing this? So that you can give the patient a prognosis. Sir, I have TOT, patient is not better. Obviously, you haven't done it on the right patient. So I think it's very important to understand sometimes why this happens. Hypermobility, who has it? Fortunately, these are the commonest patients you are going to see. Majority, about 65 to 70% of your patients. They're young, they're parents, they're active. You know, they, um, they leak when they cough, laugh, sneeze, jump, walk around, play with their children. 
How is it diagnosed? You can diagnose it in many ways. You can do urodynamics. You can make sure that their maximum urethral closure pressure is more than 20. You can do a transperineal ultrasound and look at hypermobility. You can do a simple examination in the supine position and standing position, ask them to cough and see a leak. That will tell you hypermobility. Why is it important to diagnose hypermobility? Excellent results with TRP. Excellent results with colpo suspension. And also very good results with physiotherapy. So you need to know who to send patients for physiotherapy. So there's always this question everybody asks me. Should all patients with SUI have urodynamics? And that was the challenge that I was going to put to all of you. The short answer is, in an Indian setting, can you afford to do urodynamics on all your patients? It's a very interesting question. My experience working in India, uh, unless you are in the very tier one, tier two, and high paying, the answer is no. So then what do you do? You don't treat patients? You leave them on their own? Uh, this is a very interesting question. So the next important question really is, uh, where is, what is urodynamics? What does it mean? So urodynamics has got numerous components to it. Urodynamics means taking a good history. Urodynamics means doing a good bladder diary. Urodynamics may mean doing a one hour pad test to quantify your leakage. Urodynamics may mean filling the bladder up 200 mils and doing a cough test. So you are making every effort to try and find out what the diagnosis is. That in my opinion is urodynamics. There are also very simple ways in Africa, we do what something called simple urodynamics. Simple urodynamics means what? You put a Foley catheter, attaches a, a bottle of saline to it, get a foot putty, put another infant feeding tube in the Foley catheter, and slowly start filling the bladder with the uh, saline and see what the pressure in the bladder is. And if it goes above 15 uh, centimeters of water, then you probably have um, detrusor overactivity. If the bladder capacity is less than 300 ml, then you probably have over uh, detrusor overactivity rather than stress incontinence. If your patient has got my internet connection is unstable, that's what it's telling me, but I hope you can hear me. Um, so uh, it is very important to understand that um, you can do urodynamics without actually having the fancy machine. In Africa, we have women voiding on a um, patrachi badli, a tin bucket. Okay, so they sit on, they have the, the, the commode, and under the commode is a tin bucket. So basically, once the noise starts, we start the stop clock. When the noise finishes, we stop the stop clock, and then we measure the volume. It's volume against time. That's your Euroflow metric. So you can do it quite simply if you want. So I, what I'm trying to say is, if someone sues you because you've done the wrong operation and the urologist or guys like me go, oh, you didn't do urodynamics, doctor. Why didn't you do urodynamics? Then the only way I can protect you is if you have documented all these other things. I took a good history. I did a pad test. I did a bladder diary. I quantified the incontinence. I checked the voiding. Then I can protect you. So you've made every effort to help this patient who could not necessarily avail of urodynamics. Ideally, yes, of course, you would like to do urodynamics. So I hope that is a very important aspect that people always ask. You have to use this to understand what urodynamics means. Right? Yeah. Good. Now we're we're doing well. We've got 15 more minutes for one hour to finish. So that's good. So what are the treatment options? I've told you about pelvic muscle exercise. 
Pelvic muscle exercises should be targeted. They should be only done between 16 and 20 weeks. They should be a good physio who actually instructs patients properly, but also does a PB examination to make sure they are is their glutei and they think that they are doing pelvic muscle exercise. So the only thing they get is gluteal muscle hypertrophy. Then they have powerful gluteal muscles like Serena Williams. It's not going to help their stress and confidence, right? So it's very important to understand that they are actually squeezing the puborectalis, not the perineal muscles, not the gluteal muscles. Puborectalis. So it's very important that targeted, targeted physiotherapy with a finite period only. But after that, it's not fair on the woman. You cannot let a woman suffer from embarrassment all her life just because someone says, oh, look, the physiotherapy is still working, trying to get it done. Not more than four months. Okay. They say it takes women seven years even in the Western world, to seek help for incontinence. And if you don't look after them at that episode, they will not come for another seven years. It is very embarrassing for women to go to him. It doesn't matter whether you're a male or female doctor. It's very embarrassing for them to go and say, I actually leak urine or I smell of urine all the time. It takes great courage for women to do that. So let's respect their courage and give them proper treatment. So pelvic floor exercises, vaginal estrogen, very important over in women over the age of 55. I don't really care whether they have symptoms or not. You need to give them vaginal estrogen because of that accelerated genital tissue aging, which they will get after menopause. So please give them vaginal estrogen. Oral estrogen does not work on the genital tract because the genital tract and the hippocampal gyrus of the brain, I don't know why, have a different type of receptor called ER beta, while the rest of the body has ER alpha, which is more sensitive to estradiol, while the genital tract and the hippocampal gyrus more sensitive to estriol. These are very important things that you need to understand. Minimum therapy time, four months. So must give them vaginal estrogen four months. Don't do that come on at nine. Very important. You can get this very dangerous, ugly looking bladder neck support prosthesis, which the women actually put in when they're jogging or when they're going out to support the bladder and take it out. I don't think you can have intercourse when you have this bladder neck support prosthesis, I think it will scare your husband. So uh, uh, they need to be taken out. They have into the act of intercourse the end of his penis and it's very scary. So uh, these bladder neck support prosthesis need to be used very carefully with a lot of uh, supervision. We, in our practice, very rarely use and I'll tell you the reason why when we talk about conundrum. Then you have the TOT and the retropubic sling, also called the TBT. TBT is a industrial commercial name. TOT is trans obturator tape, non-commercial. TBT is a commercial name. That's why we call it retropubic sling, RPS. It can belong to any company. You can do a birch culper suspension, you know, uh, Vivek sir from KM, Vivek Joshi, great champion of uh, uh, birch culper suspension. This fantastic birch culper suspension. For years he's been doing it, great guy. Uh, and then bulking agents, very expensive. Uh, but I am told in India, there is a lot of cosmetic surgery that goes on. So when the cosmetic surgeon has got a little bit bulking agents left uh, aside, Maybe you can ask them to use it on the bladder or the urethral bar. So these are your treatment options. What I was going to do was put some conundrums uh, because we've got 10 minutes left. Uh, and these are, we are going to 
uh, ask you guys to discuss it in Q and A. Okay, because I've got ten minutes. Uh, I know Ashwin is saying, "Sir, I don't know about that in silent." But past past minutes, your videos are put up, so you'll see what that is important. Okay. So mix stress and continence. What will you treat first, urge or stress? Second question: Intrinsic sphincter deficiency was the best treatment. I've given you the answer for that. If you have prolapse and stress incontinence, do you operate on it simultaneously or do you do a staged repair? Prolapse first or incontinence first? Occult stress incontinence. What does that mean? So these are the conundrums we are going to discuss after the videos. And the next two are failed sling. What next? What are you going to do next? You did one sling. It failed. What next? Failed trial of void. This is my favorite topic that actually trial of void failure can occur after delivery, after prolapse repair, after rectus seal repair, after sling. It can happen many times. How do you manage it? Very important discussion because there is one very simple physiological fact. If you have neglected urinary retention for more than eight hours where the bladder capacity has been stretched to more than two liters you can have permanent bladder damage that bladder will never get better again so we want to avoid that under all costs so it's also very important after delivery as well so trial avoid very important we look at the conundrums okay so let's start with the first uh, tape. I hope you can see it. This is a outside in trans obturator tape and I'm going to talk to it as I go along and I'd like to thank uh, ooh, what's going on? Here we go. So we, we do surface marking. I think I might stop it at various points uh, uh, Yep, yeah, okay. I'm just gonna stop it. So I'm going to show you we do surface marking on every TOT if you do that in your life, you will never have groin pain, okay? And very simply, what you do is you draw the genitourinary fold, you draw the lower border of the adductor longus tendon, and where it meets medial to the genitourinary fold, below the adductor longus tendon, is where you will either exit your TOT or enter your TOT. If you go higher up, you have a 4% risk of groin pain, which is permanent. You have a life member, okay? So we give what is called as a transobturator block. At that point, we inject 10 ml of saline. I'm gonna keep going. And you can feel the needle inside. So if you guys want to do TOTs, this is a fantastic block you can give. Make sure you don't prick your uh, inside finger with the needle you feel the ballooning. And then you actually mark the bladder neck and you see that's the urethra, that's the external distal urethral sulcus. This is the mid urethra we are cutting and we make a pretty big incision around two centimeters. So don't do a conjus giri, okay? There's a very important point that you will see as soon as I, um, lift this up i'm going to stop this video because what we would have done here is we would have marked something called the bladder neck so the bladder neck is marked at the bottom here it is a little blue line meets the bladder that area is like your mother-in-law you must avoid at all costs do not up operate at the level of the bladder neck. Bladder neck, you do your slings above the bladder neck, here at the mid urethral level. And if you want to do a cystocele repair, do it below the bladder neck. We now have 200 people. Yes, well done. Okay, we'll continue with our uh, virtual operation. So you can see the patient is alive. I believe me, the patient is alive. So there's no bleeding as you can see. And as soon as you say that, the bleeding starts, right? But 
if you do the hydro dissection with local and saline, you can actually make sure that the bleeding is not too bad. We always take the tissue towards the bone. So if in the next step, you will see, I push the tissue towards the bone and relax the instrument. So I'm feeling the bone now, I'm making a big tunnel, I'm putting my little, uh, my index finger inside the tunnel. See, I'm reducing, I'm taking the tissue towards the bone. Otherwise the instrument will tear your vaginal flap. So don't do that. So we make two little holes, as you can see, and then the needle is at 45 degrees and the handle is towards the patient. That is because if the handle is away from the patient, the needle goes too deep inside and it can go in obturator, it can go in bladder, it can go in bowel, it can go anywhere. So make sure that the handle of the patient is towards the patient. You'll see how we actually put our needle through with our thumb, the top thumb. It just perforates the obturator membrane and then with the inside finger, you've just gone behind the bone and then you see how my hand is going towards the patient. The right hand is handle is going towards the patient. Do not look, just keep feeling the needle and bring the needle outside over your finger and it should face towards the clitoris. If you have done that step, that means you have no fornicial perforation and you are in absolutely the correct position and you just put the tape in and you pull it out. So keep these steps very simple, okay? So same thing again, we are going to go with the other needle, handle towards the patient, 45 degrees, put your finger in the tunnel, you put your needle through, use your top thumb to perforate the obturator, you feel the give, you see that give, the handle is towards the patient, rotate slowly, Do not look, you won't look, just keep feeling. Feel, 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 rotate, keep feeling, rotate, keep feeling, rotate, till you get out under my finger. I haven't got, but if you feel it, then you don't have to work, then you will have a successful TOT, not a problem. Now, important thing to understand is the trajectory of the TOT is flat. It's like a U. The trajectory of the retropubic sling is like a V, right? So you want to um, basically uh, make sure that put reasonably as much tension as you want because the trajectory is flat, you can't over tighten it. And once you've done that, just take some deep uh, sutures where we presume the pubo-urethral ligaments have been dislocated and that's the operation finished. We don't put catheters in. And never ever pull on that sling when you're cutting it. Cut it flush to the skin and then just work it out. Don't pull on it. Do not pull. Do you see my hand? because my research fellows pull on it, gets too tight, patient doesn't void, but it flushes the skin. We don't use a catheter before the operation. We don't use a catheter during the operation. We don't use a catheter after the operation. We don't use a catheter, no need. There is no need. And so we're gonna cystoscope them just to see a urethroscopy so, and a lot of people say, I'm telling cystoscope now. A hysteroscope and a cystoscope, every gynecologist wants to be laparoscopic surgeon, IVF specialist, and obstetrician. So you have got scopes. Don't tell me you haven't got scopes. If you've got a hysteroscope, you can still put it in the urethra. It's one hole above the vagina. Just look at the urethra, make sure that it is normal. So, you know, I don't believe this fact that people shouldn't do. I think you should do a lot more cystoscopies. That's always helpful because when you tear the bladder during a cesarean <laughs> section, <laughs> you should be able to do a, a cystoscopy at uh, um, three o'clock in the morning. Someone jumped in. I heard some funny noise. Never mind. Okay, we're moving on to the next, which is the retropubic sling. Oh my God, time is almost up. 
We can continue? Ashwini? Yes, sir, yes, sir. Okay, right. Uh, okay, good. Okay, so we're going to do a red. Time is not an issue. Draw a pubic sling now. This is a totally deaf pubis. Then we mark the pubic tubercle. And, and basically, we, uh, so we use a lot, lot of marking. Doesn't matter if you've done 7,000 operations or 20,000 operations. Every patient is different. You must mark the anatomy. The other thing we mark is the, see, that's the distal urethral fold. That's the mid urethral fold where the hymen is. Now we're going to do some retropubic installation. We've got a 20 gauge spinal needle. We're going to put 20 ml of saline. You feel just at the point that you make it, just go behind the bone. Women put in eight centimeters needle, aspirate, put in about 15 ml, and then uh, pull out the needle and um, by about a centimeter or two, and then inject the rest five ml. If you aspirate, and you see yellow, that means that's urine, you're in the bladder. Don't inject. So can you repeat you, this? You have just got disconnected a few minutes back. I think I? this video. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So basically, we are doing retropubic local infiltration. You just go behind the bone, 20 ml of saline, you aspirate. If nothing comes out, just inject all 20 ml in that spot. But first inject 15 ml at 5 ml, just pull out the needle a little bit and then put in the local. What this does is actually does what's called as aqua dissection between the scaver retius and the bladder. So your risk of bladder perforation reduces. Then you do mid urethral hydro distension. So in the mid urethra, you use just the tip of the needle and inject about 20 ml of saline. You will see blanches, it does a lot of blanching. Blanching is very good. Blanch, 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 we always say, which means that you're putting the local in the correct place, right? We're gonna make an incision which starts just below the distal urethral fold and goes into the mid urethra only and no sasubai, no mother-in-law, we avoid the bladder neck. So you free the lateral flaps and the flap at six o'clock and you see as i said the patient is still alive so i know there's minimal bleeding that's because of the hydro dissection not because i'm a really good surgeon now same thing we make a tunnel we perforate the pelvic diaphragm and then we feel the bone and you will see that i'm feeling the bone see i can actually push off the bone and that is very important. So you create the tunnel, it doesn't have to be as big a tunnel for TOT, big tunnels, for retropubic thing, not necessarily a big tunnel. Same thing on the other side, you just feel, perforate the pelvic diaphragm, you feel the bone, you bounce your scissors off the bone. You can see how you can bounce the scissors, make sure you're tunnel. So that means you can't traumatize the urethra. And then by using the needles properly, you avoid traumatizing the bladder. All my fellows have done a shish kebab of the bladder. That's normal, it's 6%. So that's it's good training. But this needle is very ergonomic, it's blunt. That's what I'm saying. And you feel the bone go behind the bone and then just slide it through. See how the tip is blunt. I'm putting my finger on it and there's no blood. That's what I'm trying to show. When you actually have a blunt tip, it pushes tissue away rather than tearing tissue. So a blunt tip is actually a good thing, okay? And you've got two needles. Some people like to put one needle on either side, but ideally we should put one needle at a time and do a cystoscopy with a 70 degree scope. The tape we use is a polypropylene tape by Coloplast. It's the softest tape available in the market. It has no elasticity, zero elasticity, which means when you put the tape, 
you don't get any bounce back, which you get with the other uh, tapes. So where you put this tape is where it stays. So what I'm really saying there is, if you put it in the wrong place, it will stay in the wrong place. If you put it in the right place, it will stay in the right place. So where you put it is where it stays. I think that's very important. Now what we're doing here, you can see there's a catheter in the urethra. Some people like to do what's called a urethral deviation, but it's on the same side at which the needle is going. Um, we don't, I don't really adhere to it too much. That's Dr. Gina Wolf. That's Surendra Bhutra. We also have Indian anesthetists, wonderful people, wonderful. Um, so um, basically, I felt the bone, I'm going behind the bone, I'm pushing the needle through. You look, I'm using my right hand. My right hand is very sensitive because I'm right handed. So I'm using my right hand to feel behind the symphysis pubis. I will not touch the needle until it tints. It has to tint the skin up. I'll show you on the other pass. Otherwise, you will feed the bladder onto the needle and cause a perforation. So don't let your this is a 70 degree scope. And there's Surendra is always looking. And we're looking at the 11 o'clock position, making sure the needle hasn't gone through and wiggling it. And that's fine. Then you take the tape off the needle and very slowly pull the needle out. This is a retro pubic sling we're doing, okay? The needle's coming out. Then we can use the same needle or we can use the other needle. It doesn't matter. Again, urethral deviation. Keep the tape flat, put it through the needle, use your dominant hand. So a lot of people think I should change my hand. No, you must use your most sensitive hand for the most sensitive part of the operation. For me, look, I'm using my right hand again. So it doesn't matter whether I'm going on the left-hand side or the right-hand side, I'm using my dominant hand. And that gives you sensitivity. It's very important to have sensitivity. See how I'm passing the needle. Now, nobody will touch that abdomen until I see the needle tenting the abdominal wall, which means I've gone through the rectus sheath. Then I will press it myself. Otherwise, you can feed the bladder on the needle and get a perforation. Again, a 70 degree scope, making sure that your, um, you haven't perforated the bladder. You can fish kebab it at one o'clock. So one o'clock and 11 o'clock are where you can see the needles. And we, we have people who can um, shish kebab it. My fellow is laughing on the side because she's only done one shish kebab so far. Check the urethra, make sure there's no um, um, tape or trauma to the urethra. And see how the urethra is closing. Can you see how it's closing? We call it the wink effect. So that's, we, we keep a little pair of scissors in there, make sure that it's tension. Now this is, in, how, look how slowly I took out my scissors. It's very important for, to do this very slowly. Don't try and pull, push, pull, push all the time. Do it slowly. And you see how the, 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 the tape is surrounding the urethra. Basically now we're going to take two fascial stooges, close the, um, close the um, vagina and we do what's called a natural fill trial avoid. So two hours later, the patient will go and uh, void. Now, you have to understand, for these operations to work, we do them under GA. We don't give spinal. If you have a spinal, then you have to put a catheter in for at least eight to 10 hours and then make them do a trial avoid. Sometimes you can do what's called a Creed's maneuver, fill the bladder with 200, 250 ml of water and then jump on the abdomen and see if it actually leaks. Even if it leaks, don't try and tighten it too much. Because usually the temptation is I'm going to tighten it too much. And then if you do that, your patient will get retention. In our series of nearly 7,000 slings now, we have a 3% voiding dysfunction rate. And we have a less than 1% sling erosion rate. So if you select your patients correctly, you do your dissection correctly, you give them analgesia, you do a standard good trial of void, you should get a 97% success rate and a very happy patient. Uh, most of our patients are done as day cases, so they come in the morning and go home in the afternoon. 
we have a 3% readmission rate, sometimes for bleeding, but then it involves also prolapse repairs and everything in the live series that we're doing. We've got a doctor, Dr. Sandhya Gupta is working with me. She has done an analysis of all our cases with ERAS, enhanced recovery after urogynecology surgery. Do not pull on those tapes. And that's our website, so you can come anytime, choose whatever documents you want to take, just give us credit for the origin of the documents and please use them in your practice. Um, and those are the two videos. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. So uh, happy to take a few questions. Um, and if you want, I can go back to the conundrums if you want to have a little refresher. Uh, I'm just gonna have a quick drink of water and then uh, it's over to you, Ashwini. Yeah, so there have been a lot of questions. I think, sir, we'll go one by one. Sir, everybody wants to know, uh, what do you encounter when you go from skin to the needle? Layer by layer from skin, subcute tissue in that way. Okay, it depends on which operation you're talking about. I'll do both, transobturator and um, retropubic. So if you're doing transobturator, you're going to get skin. Okay. You are going to get adductor magnus. You should not get adductor longus. You must get obturator externus, obturator membrane, obturator internus, and part of the pelvic diaphragm. This is for transobturator. For retropubic, really all you should have is the pelvic diaphragm. Then you go into the retropubic space. And then you just have basically posterior rectus sheath, rectus sheath, maybe sometimes rectus muscle. Uh, so rectus muscle, then rectus sheath, subcutaneous fat, and skin. So you have to understand that uh, with the transobturator, there are more muscles that are penetrated. With the retropubic, there are less muscles that are penetrated. But there is a longer contact point for the sling. That's why the sling is like a V, while with the obturator, the sling is like a U. Yeah? Okay. So they want to know what is the status of the tapes in India? Are they still available with so many cases going on with J&J? &J? Um, I don't know whether they're available in India, but they're definitely available in Australia. We haven't stopped doing them. I think that the tapes are still available. Um, in, in India, um, probably guys like uh, Vineet Mishra or Raja Maheshwari or Shri Kala uh, will be able to tell you which companies are making it. I think you just need to be very careful about the type of polypropylene you're using. You must use macroporous polypropylene. That's all I'm saying. Uh, and it's very important to give patients preoperative um, vaginal estrogens, make sure you assess them properly and do very full thickness dissection so you don't get sling erosion. Okay. And how do you decide for the patients which patients would go for TOT and which would go for the retropubic sling? So look, I think the bottom line is very simple, isn't it? If basically if the retropubic sling works for both hypermobility and intrinsic sphincter deficiency, then technically all patients should have a retropubic sling, right? But the problem is that retropubic slings inherently are a bit more difficult to do than transobturator types. So basically the rule is very simple. If you are absolutely convinced it's hypermobility, young patient, active, paras, uh, then do a TOT. If you have any doubts about whether they have intrinsic sphincter deficiency or not, then ideally do a retropubic. Because even a birch culpa suspension does not work very well in intrinsic sphincter deficiency. Luckily, 60 to 70 percent of patients you operate on have hypermobility, while only 25 to 30 percent of patients have ISD. So that's why you have a pretty high success rate with DOT, even if you don't bother to think about whether this is ISD or whether this is hypermobility. Yeah. Okay. What about if, if, if there is, if while putting the tape, if the bladder is perforated, how yeah. do you proceed? Yeah, so we have a very simple saying, when in doubt, pull it out. 
if you think the bladder has been perforated, or even if you cannot see the perforation, but you think it is very close to the bladder, just pull it out. Pull the tape out, re-dissect, and you can put it in at the same time. It's fine. We allow our fellows maximum of three holes. If they do three perforations, then after that, the boss has to take over. And you will be surprised that actually most of these patients don't even need to have a catheter. As long as you have a good trial of work. Ideally, if you have a perforation, best thing is put a catheter in for 24 hours and you're just sleeping well. Yeah. So everybody wants you to discuss this conundrums one by one. A quick revision, maybe. Okay. They didn't want to discuss conundrums. More water. Uh, okay. So mix stress incontinence. Which to treat first? If you have a combination of stress incontinence and urge incontinence, always treat the urge incontinence first. So for the first four months, anticholinergics, vaginal estrogen, avoid bladder irritants. Make sure you reduce tea, coffee, wine, etc. Do something called timed voiding. Timed voiding means during the daytime, the woman should empty her bladder every two to three hours, whether she needs to go or not. Do that for four months. See the patient afterwards. If there is an improvement with the urgency, then treat their stress incontinence, but continue treating their urge incontinence. Otherwise, what happens is you treat the stress incontinence. They're not leaking when they cough, laugh, sneeze, but they go, I can't hold my urine. Every time I need to go, I'm leaking. So for a patient, it still means leaking. They don't care whether you divide it into urge incontinence or stress incontinence. For them, it's leaking. So don't forget to continue treating the urge incontinence. Urge incontinence requires medication, dedication. Medication and dedication. Lifestyle changes, reducing weight, not drinking Coca-Cola, reducing caffeinated drinks, and also reducing weight. That's very important. Intrinsic sphincter deficiency, we told you what is the best treatment. Best treatment is retropubic sphincter. Now, the next two topics could take one hour each. So the bottom line is, if you have a prolapse, for example, let's talk of a level one prolapse, which is uterus cervical prolapse, or level two prolapse, which is cystocele, rectocele, or a level three prolapse, bladder neck hypermobility, and posteriorly an enlarged genital hiatus. Would you repair the prolapses and the incontinence? And there is demonstrable stress incontinence. The data is you can offer this to, uh, to the patient as either a staged treatment or a simultaneous treatment. The staged treatment basically means you fix the prolapse first and see if that has made any impact on the incontinence. Or you can do a simultaneous operation where you're actually doing the prolapse repair and then the management of the stress incontinence, the tape. The tape should always be done at the end of the procedure. Once you finish all your prolapse repairs, whatever you want to do, anterior coprophy, posterior coproperineurophy, vaginal hysterectomy, sacrospinous, whatever the hell you want to do, do it first and then do your sling. Sling should always be last because otherwise the tape will move while you're doing your prolapse repair. If you're doing a simultaneous operation, do your prolapse repairs first and then the sling. Or you can do a staged procedure where six weeks after prolapse surgery, you can actually do the sling. Occult stress incontinence is different. Occult stress incontinence means the patient has no symptoms of stress incontinence. She's got a genital prolapse. You basically put the fingers in the vagina and you do your aerodynamics and she leaks when you reduce the prolapse. So the patient has no symptom, but it's occult because it's hidden by the prolapse. So what can happen is you could prepare the patient 
and then she comes back and says ye kya operation kiya basically i'm leaking urine now right so occal stress incontinence is a conundrum but there are lots of studies now showing that do not there is a 50 50% split between urogynecologists and urologists about whether you should treat occult stress incontinence simultaneously i prefer not to treat it simultaneously i do it as a staged procedure there are some studies which show that you have to do six unnecessary tapes to treat one occult stress incontinence successfully which means the companies make a lot of money the doctor makes a lot of money because he charges extra for this operation but in essence you are doing six unnecessary tape operation that's why i do it as a staged procedure we're almost there fail sling if your sling fails what next so first of all i want to know why is has the sling failed as in is this patient got recurrent stress incontinence or have they got urge incontinence have they got a uti is it a different presentation so first you need to rule out whether it is true recurrent stress incontinence or is this urge incontinence have they got a uti or you need to rule that out second thing is you need to know why did my sling fail was it my patient choice that was wrong or is my sling in the wrong place to make sure that your sling is in the right place you can do a transparent ultrasound all you need to ensure is find out whether the sling is at the mid urethral level if it's at the level of the bladder neck that sling is not effective so it's not a failed sling it's a failed surgery right we do sling on sling after we have ensured that the first thing we did is in the correct place that there is no uti there is no overactive bladder but the patient still has recurrent urinary tract infection but we always do it cross trajectory so if we have done a tot first then we will do a retropubic sling if we have done a retropubic sling first then we will put a tot next so you have what we call cross trajectory no point in doing the same trajectory again and again it's not going to work so sling on sling can be done but after careful analysis of the patient symptoms and making sure and this is something that people who are used to doing recurrent stress incontinence should do it should not be done by mm, general uh, gynecologists so sling on sling is a is a more difficult challenge but you need to find out first So some people get so disappointed they go I'll just send them to the urologist. No wait. Just see is your sling in the right place? Have they got a UTI? Have they got overactive bladder? So you can actually identify some of those problems and tackle them rather than just refer them on. This is going to take 2 hours. So the important part is what do you mean by fail trial avoid? That's the first important question. It doesn't matter whether your patient has spinal ga whether your patient is post delivery with genital trauma whether your patient is post delivery with an epidural doesn't matter first is zero hour what does zero hour mean zero hour means that is the time when you start marking the time because zero plus 2 hours in which when the patient is going to void that could mean zero hour starts when you take the catheter out zero hours could mean when the patient have had an epidural have a birth the legs have come back you take the catheter out zero hour means the patient has not had a catheter at all has anti continent surgery and now is in recovery so it's important to identify zero hour zero plus 2 hours is extremely crucial doesn't matter how intelligent your nurses are or your fellow doctors are the instruction should be very simple at 0 plus 2 hours patient must go to void oh, but she doesn't feel like voiding 
don't care. Go and void. Now, if she doesn't void, then you can do an ultrasound, check what's in the bladder volume, maybe give her more fluid, maybe give her pain relief. But zero plus two hours is the crucial test for your trial of void. Because if you fail that, you just keep failing it again and again and again. And then the patients get very anxious and then they stop voiding. Then you have to put a cap. So zero plus two hours. There are only four types of patients in this group. One, patient A will void 400 ml of urine, have a residual less than 100, send them home. Done. No problem. Patient B is a patient voiding what we call half and half. So they void 250, they have a residual of 200. They void 300, they have a residual of 200. But they are emptying half their bladder volume. These patients need something called timed voiding. Make them make sure that they go to the toilet every two hours by the clock, not by desire. So you say, if you wake up at six in the morning, six o'clock, eight o'clock, 10 o'clock, 12 o'clock, two o'clock, four o'clock, six o'clock, eight o'clock, and then they can go to bed. Time voiding, two weeks, bring them back, check out for sound. If the residuals are less than a hundred, no problems, don't worry about it. Patient C is the tricky patient. This is the patient that voids 50 ml, but retains 200, 250 ml. I call them poor voiders, very poor voiders. They just go, do a little bit, come up. So you ask them, have you passed urine? Yes, I have. Patient C and patient D should be treated as the same. You should actually treat them as if they are not passing urine, right? So then what do you do? Patient's not passing urine, what do you do? So you can give them hourly voids, do ultrasound, but once you get to a volume of four, 500 and they're not able to void, it's very unlikely that they will void. So the first thing you need to do is put a catheter in for 48 hours. And say these things happen, you can get tissue edema, will give you pain relief, will give you antibiotics. Once the inflammation goes, you'll be all right. So after 48 hours, you remove the catheter and that is your zero hour again. Same thing. So they could be patient A or patient B. Past 400, less than 100 residual, can go home. Patient B, emptying half their bladder, holding half their bladder, make sure they do time voiding, get them back after two weeks. Do their check ultrasound, they can go home. Or they can be patient C or D, not voiding at all. Now what do you do? Patients not voiding at all. Now you have to start putting a little bit of uh, worry in the patient. Oh, this is a bit tricky. This doesn't happen to us normally. But I tell you what, we'll probably put a catheter in. Some people put a catheter in for two days. Some people catheter, put a catheter in for five days. It doesn't matter. And you say, look, We'll try this, we'll give you some antibiotics, we'll give you some anti-inflammatories, let all those tissues heal, and we'll take the catheter out after two days or five days. Now, if you don't void, then we might have to do something. This something could mean clean intermittent self-catheterization. This something could mean maybe prolonged catheterization for four weeks. This something could mean sling division. This something could mean taking down some sutures from your over-enthusiastic anterior corporeal. So you are already telling them, I'm gonna put a catheter in now, but we might need to do something about it. So the patient is already prepared when they come back next time for their zero hour treatment. So you take the catheter out and then zero hours plus two. Patient A, 400 mils, residual less than 50, send them home. Patient B, emptying half and half. Basically, you see them in two weeks, make them do time boarding, do an ultrasound. Patient C and D, you should consider surgical correction or clean intermittent self-catheterization. How simple is that? All Ramayana in five minutes.
thank you for letting me talk about the conundrums. Um, and thank you so much for inviting me. I hope you guys have had a wonderful time. I'd like to just thank all my friends who joined in. I know there were 200, now there's 164. So some people are leaking like SUI. It's, uh, this happens all the time. Uh, but uh, lovely to see you. Stay safe. And um, call me anytime if you want to talk about genital prolapse. We can do another one uh, sometime. Victoria is going to uh, help me do many more slides. So yes, it's no problem. Cheers. You. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think all of us have really enjoyed the, the session. Uh, crisp, clear, crystal clear messages, I think. And uh, Ashwini, are there any further questions that have yet to be answered? Uh, there are one or two questions you want me to take them. They want to ask till what age do Kegel's exercises help? What age? 100. Do Kegel's exercises help? 100. Okay. Yeah, you can, you can do Kegels exercise. My point is, you do Kegels for four months only. If it doesn't work, got to treat, got to move on in life. And Kegels does not work for prolapse. It only works for stress relieving incontinence and does not work for intrinsic sphincter deficiency, it only works for hypermobility. So, Shilke, I want to know your opinion on Sarogi tape. On, uh, oh, don't, don't even go there. Very controversial. I love the man, but uh, look, there, we had a big discussion in AICOG in Lucknow. A lot of people attacked him. He's a very good friend. I don't think you should attack anyone like that. I think the important part is two things. One is proof of concept, and second is longevity of concept. So first of all, you need to have proof of concept. Proof of concept means you do the operation, with some ethics governance, and that actually your operation kind of works. If you say your operation works, then you need to compare it with the gold standard. So you need to do a randomized trial where half of the patients have your operation, other half have the gold standard. And then you need to see whether your operation compares well with the other operation. And then the third thing you want to look at is longevity. Okay, it might work for six months? Does it work for five years? So these are the three points that we discussed. And I think when you talk about it scientifically, it's much more respectful. He's a senior man. He's a lovely man. You know, I thought sometimes people get very enthusiastic and want to attack. Uh, I don't think that's the right thing. I think the important thing to understand is that you need to look at all these three things, proof of concept, comparison against gold standard, and longevity. Um, so yes, um, um, you know, I, I, I actually have operated with him, so <laughs> I know about what you're talking about. Yes. But, uh, would I do it? No, I would not do it because I'd probably not be allowed to do it ethically in my country. But, you know, even in India, I think this is an opportunity to, to do those three things. You can do proof of concept, you can do a randomized trial, and you can do longevity studies. Just uh, doing it, doing it, doing it doesn't help. You've got to look at the science behind it, right? So yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. So much, sir. Yeah, I think we'll stop taking the questions now. It was really wonderful having you here, and I think we should do some more sessions, as you just said. We'll definitely yeah, plan some more. Yeah, I think. Well, I love Pune. I love Punekers. I am one of them. So I, I just. Just want to send my love to all my friends and uh, uh, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Stay safe. Thank you. And uh, social I distance. Do, I think we should do. Okay. I think we should do more of uh, pelvic floor dysfunction uh, uh, programs later on again with you. It was very nice. Good. Yeah. Happy to. It's my yes. job. I'm a teacher. I like to teach, but uh, our whole philosophy is about unraveling making it simple. You know how Buddha holds his hands? You have to make this, remove the knots one at a time and make each concept simple. If you make it simple, then you actually can care for patients better. If you make it complicated, then everyone's wondering what is really going on. So it's about simplification. 
Okay. Good. Good. Excellent. Thank you. And thank, thank you, you to Victoria who looked after me. So, okay. God bless. I'm going to mute now. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.